Okay, I would like to introduce our next set of speakers. First, we have Ms. Naledi Pendur. She's the Minister of Higher Education in South Africa, and also Ms. Yaneth Gihar, who is the former Minister of Education in Colombia. Our moderator for this session will be Mr. Simon Cox from The Economist magazine. Please join me in welcoming them. Uh, so thanks for that introduction. Um, we only have 30 minutes, uh, and according to Professor Agarwal, we can only hold your concentration for six minutes. Uh, so I'm going to be uh, very brief. Um, we're all here in favor of more education, uh, but we're in favor of many other things as well. We're in favor of more infrastructure, more health care, tighter security. Uh, and it's in a country's cabinet where those battles get fought out. And this morning, we're going to be talking to uh, two guests with deep ministerial experience who've waged that battle on behalf of education. And we're all in favor of more educational innovation as well. But if you think about what drives innovation, a lot of it is trial and error. But unfortunately, in education, the room for error is very limited. Uh, the stakes are very high, and someone's always going to get blamed if things go wrong. Um, in some ways, it's worse even than medicine, because at least in medicine, innovators get to test their drugs on guinea pigs, rats in the laboratory first. You don't have that option in education. No educational innovator has ever been able to say, you know, minister, uh, adopt my literacy program. It's showing great results uh, with mice. They're literally devouring books. Um, <laughs> So the Minister of Education has to deal with these potential downsides, has to confront these competing challenges for resources. Uh, the definition of a minister, at least in my book, is in control of many things and blamed for everything. Uh, let me introduce uh, our two guests. Um, so on my far left is uh, Naledi Pandor, who is a Minister for Higher Education and Training uh, in South Africa. And to my immediate left, is Yanath Giha, who's the former Minister of, Edu of Education in Colombia. So these are two middle-income emerging economies where education uh, is hugely important. Um, uh, former Minister uh, Yanath, if I could start with you. Um, yesterday, we, you may remember, we, uh, at the gala dinner, uh, we heard from uh, Andreas Schleicher of the OECD, who is singing the praises of one of our laureates. Um, Mr. Schleicher, a few years ago, was also talking about Colombia's education system where he said there had been a silent revolution, a silent revolution. Um, could you explain uh, what that revolution was and, and how it was accomplished? Thank you, Simon, and let me say hello to all of you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be in Hong Kong. It's my first time, and I hope to get around and see a little bit of the city. Andreas is an expert in Colombia, and he has been going to Colombia for many years. And yes, several years ago, he mentioned the silent revolution. And, you know, several years later, I can say that this has happened specifically for one reason. It was a decision that was made in Colombia. President Santos decided that education would be in the center of the agenda. This has not happened in Colombia for many years. We were in the middle of a war. Everything that, you know, every important news in Colombia before that was regarding security and regarding an armed conflict. Only several years ago, we were able to decide that education would be a key aspect of our development. And several things came with it. The first thing was that we started to increase the budget in Colombia. For many, many years, defense budget was the number one priority. And of course, budget was number one in defense sector. I used to work at the defense sector at that time. But education started to grow. And in the last years, education has been the number one, have been the number one budget in Colombia. Still, we need more, of course. We always need more. But it has been a conviction coming with the right monies to start this revolution. And many programs starting to fall into place with this budget. Um, we started, uh, we decided that we would put teachers at the center or at the heart 
of our education system, and we wanted to motivate them. So we developed several programs. For example, we launched uh, scholarship programs for teachers so they could do master's degrees. We needed to motivate them, to inspire them. We launched another program that we developed with the Liverpool University hmm. in the UK called, in Spanish, the translation would be PTA. And we would send the best teachers of Colombia to the lowest performers lowest performer schools in Colombia, and in classroom, we would help them to, um, to make better the, the pedag pedagogical practice, I mean, to really raise up the standards. And with this, we made other programs. For example, we started raising up the salaries of teachers. We, I know, and universities will tell me, and research might say that that's not enough, raising up the salaries is not enough, but with the right combination of factors, we have been able to raise up the quality of the education in Colombia. Um, you know, many other things have happened you know, to make this revolution, and which I, I like the word, but again, we're starting. And of course, we will need several years or decades to really see results the ones that we're expecting in the country. And, and why silent? Why was it a silent revolution? Well, at that moment, I think we were not you know, loud about what we were doing in education. We were in the middle of the peace process. I think the last four years have not been silent at all. Now, now we're talking in Colombia about education. We didn't do it before. I mean, you would never see in Colombia a lot of people talking about education six or seven years ago. I mean, if there was you know, something happening, but then a few years ago, now everything is about education. Today, if you open the news in Colombia, you would see education all around. Uh, some things that I like, perhaps others not, but education is all around. And I think that in a country where everyone is talking about education, something is really happening. Um, Minister Pando, I mean, in South Africa, there's always a lot of attention, I think, uh, paid to education. Mm -hmm. um, you were formerly uh, Minister of Education as a whole. Yeah. Uh, then they split the portfolio. Uh, you're now Minister of Higher Education and Training. Mm -hmm. um, it's often said, uh, especially in middle-income countries, that higher education commands disproportionate share of the resources, too much attention. Um, I'd be interested in your view of that. I'd also be interested wh whether your view changed when you became Minister of Higher Education <laughs> as opposed to Minister of Education as a whole. Yeah. Well, um, I've always believed that uh, higher education is extremely important to the entire education sector in a mm. country because if you have a quality higher education system and if you can appropriately focus on education it's in, in its entirety, you actually build the research and innovation base to influence all levels. In South Africa at the moment, the largest proportion of the national budget is devoted to basic education. Right. And so it receives the greatest attention. In terms of post-school education, we have technical and vocational and universities, and I'm responsible for that. Uh, technical and vocational education has been a poor cousin hmm. for many, many years because in our population, universities have prestige. Right. And so uh, parents and communities believe their children should go to university and get a degree or uh, a profession. We're trying to shift that uh, interest toward technical and vocational because that's where the jobs are, that's where opportunities lie. But in order to do that, we're having to invest in the quality of technical and vocational education and build very strong links between those institutions and industry, which has been a very tenuous link in the past. I was surprised at the outcome of the poll, right. uh, that employers are, are not a significant part uh, of, a, of drivers for changing education, because I believe they are. Mm. I think industry influences the character of skills a society needs, the nature of entrepreneurship, uh, and so we do need to have a stronger link between uh, institutions, particularly of post-secondary education, and uh, employers, and it's something that uh, we're, we're working to build. I also believe that innovation is absolutely important, so in between education and higher education now, I was Minister of Science and Technology, mm -hmm. And we devoted a, a lot of investment toward innovation in a basic uh, education. And we saw some interesting impacts through that.
Uh, I'd be very interested in any examples uh, you can offer. Well, for example, uh, one of the things that scientists uh, have been working on in our country is looking at how you can create more appropriate models for access to clean water, renewable energy resources, uh, using solar, for example, in a country like ours with an, an immense amount of sunlight, and then looking at uh, how you use uh, information communication technologies for teaching. So what we did was introduce a pilot that draws together innovations in these three areas, information communication technology, water resources, and energy renewables, and place that in schools in a district, and actually work very closely with teachers because we found introducing technology without training mm. the educator actually has no impact whatsoever. But once the educators are comfortable with the technology and have all the curriculum available to them, you actually have a dynamic impact. So bringing all that into that district influenced not just the quality of the learning and teaching in the schools, but had an amazing impact on community members who suddenly felt they needed to be closer to the schools because they were providing opportunities for resource support that parents had never enjoyed before. And so suddenly, you had a community and education link, which benefited not just adults, but the children as well, because the missing, which was the parent in education, suddenly came into play. That's interesting. Um, I should mention that uh, you in the audience can submit questions. If you find your concentration wavering, uh, you're, you're able to submit questions uh, over the app, uh, and I promise to um, have a look at them even if I don't promise to ask all of them. Um, uh, can we stay with the, the question of vocational education for a moment? Uh, you mentioned that the link used to be tenuous. Uh, why, uh, and how have you tried to forge a tighter link? Well, I think, um, as you know, South Africa emerges from a very sad history of discrimination. And for the majority of the population, uh, they were excluded from technical jobs. They were reserved for particular groups in our country. And so in order to uh, advance for the majority population, which is the black, you, only, you would desire higher education, which is university hmm. uh, education. And in that domain, you generally would want to be, either, if you were really, really clever, a doctor, uh, not quite clever, a priest, and not that bright, maybe a teacher. So those were you know, the aspirations. <laughs> And now with freedom, you know, the gates are open. Mm -hmm. um, and suddenly, you have a real shortage of technical and vocational people. Right. Because the majority were excluded from that. And because of uh, discrimination and reservation, you had very inadequate numbers there. And so you're having to open this up. But still the population thinks, no, no, I don't want to be a plumber. It's not quite top of the rank. Uh, employment, but that's where you can have your own company, you, you know, massive opportunities for entrepreneurship. So we are really shifting the attention of young people toward this sector. And to succeed, we've seen from countries like Austria, Poland, Germany, hmm. that the link with industry is critical. And so we're forming links uh, with private sector companies. We uh, have contracted apprenticeships for young people as they enter different occupations and trades. Um, and I think we're beginning to change the manner in which the public perceives uh, technical and vocational education. Um, I don't know what the experiences are like in Colombia. Is it the same sort of allocation of prestige uh, that Minister Pando was describing? I mean, it's incredible because I'm not an expert in the South African system or in the South African situation. And I, you know, before coming up, I asked the minister about it. And I said, okay, we have the same situation in Colombia. There's like a big prestige around you know, professional and universities, but, you know, people don't want to go to technical institutions. So we have, like, a huge difference between our country and, for example, European countries, like Germany, in which 70% of our, of our kids, or young men or, and women, they want to go to universities for professional careers, and they don't want to go and study technical careers. So we have been developing several programs in Colombia to start calling the attention of young people and the industry to work together. I mean, we're like some sort of in the same situation and trying to change the pyramid because we have the, you know, the pyramid is, you know, 
yeah. you know, the country. Uh, if you go to Germany, which, you know, we studied a lot and we uh, were advised by them in many of the ways that we could do it, you know, 70% of the people would go to technical institutions and they would study technical careers, 30% professional. In Colombia, is exactly the opposite. Yeah. And I guess there's a big, big, big challenge there and we need to change mindset, we need to change the culture, we need to change the ideas around this um, type of careers and you know, move on the prestige in them. Um, this uh, whole event is about uh, innovation uh, mm. in education. I mean, you've both described efforts to expand quality, expand quantity, um, but are there any specific innovative programs that you've tried to introduce or shepherd through, and, and what have been your experiences? Uh, Minister Giha, why don't I start with you? Mm. Um, innovation is a key aspect in everything that we, you know, want to do in education. And in a country that was, um, that had violence all around, we had many, many, many rural areas that were, you know, so much away from access to quality of education. There in those places, technology and innovation uh, are key. And we have been able, you know, we have launched many programs and, you know, in, when I was minister in my office, I received so many people that were coming with, you know, the best ideas and, I mean, you know, really extraordinary ideas and, you know, businessmen that would launch the best programs and there was always two problems, always. One, connectivity. I don't know if you have the same problem in South Africa. I mean, if you see, a, you know, you go to a place in Europe or the US, perhaps that's not a big deal, but in Colombia, you know, we don't get connectivity, you know, uh, everywhere and we have you know, really, really rural areas that are, are still uh, not connected. I mean, we have, I mean, we did a, you know, for in the last eight years, we did an amazing job in terms of connecting the country. But again, there are many ideas that were coming uh, and we didn't have the right connectivity to really, you know, uh, support the system that we're creating. And the other one, something that we have uh, heard today several times, we didn't have the teachers prepared. Uh, for, you know, for this type of innovation or technologies. So there's always this big challenge. I mean, we need to start training our teachers. We need to, you know, include them in all the process. And as, as you mentioned, they need to be part of this since the beginning. So we are really effective on the way that we are able to implement innovation and new technologies. Uh, Minister Pandor. I think a big challenge is the cost of data right. and then accessibility, particularly for rural uh, communities. The way we've addressed it, in the post-school sector is to encourage collaboration. So we've developed a network, a research network that all universities uh, are connected to and we've linked science council. We're now looking at bringing in the further education and training vocational institutions to this uh, South African research network as we call it because it's a more cost-effective, accessible uh, uh, approach to providing digital access. Uh, so I think uh, really the innovation is to try and look for solutions that work for as many of your collaborating institutions as possible. Because if you try and have a single institution solution, it's just not cost effective. Mm. Uh, not all the institutions are able uh, to gain access. And so you enhance inequity rather than having uh, what we desire, which is equality of access to modern technology. Right, um, well, I have access to this bit of modern technology, which is making my job very easy by suggesting um, several good questions. And um, there's one question about language. Uh, is language development in South Africa and Colombia doing well? Um, I guess this is a question about possibly linguistic English. barriers. English. Or, or, or possibly uh, about English, yeah. Well, if we're, if we're, if we're talking about English, there's a big challenge yet, I mean, still in Colombia. We developed a program uh, and we had a lot of South Africans with the program, um, native speakers. We were, I mean, because, you know, we had a big difference between private and public schools. Private schools in Colombia account for 20% of schooling and public, it's 80% of schooling. Those, the 20% would always have more access to better teachers and, well, I mean, we have good teachers in public and private, but in terms of English, we had more possibilities and better teachers in the private schools. So we decided to develop a program in which we brought native speakers from all around the world, in the US, Canada, Australia, I mean, everywhere that we could find you know, native English speakers, and we 
brought them to public schools in Colombia, to rural and urban areas, to both, so we could raise up the level of English. We started the program in 2014. Uh, for, we have been doing, running the program for four years, and it has proven to be very, very effective. We started, I mean, it would have been great if we could start it with the kids, you know, the, when, they are, when they are little, but we decided that we needed to graduate kids with better level of English. So we introduced these native speakers, teachers, uh, in ninth grade. Uh, and we have seen uh, every year a raising up in the level of English. But again, I mean, there's a big, um, a big way forward and a lot to be done still. Uh, Minister well, Pando. English is a widely spoken yeah. second language in South Africa. Yeah. But uh, what we discovered is there's a very big difference between communicative competence and academic competence. And so we have had to provide uh, academic development support, particularly in language, uh, for students in higher education, because uh, they find it uh, a challenge to cope with the cognitive demand of English as a main medium of instruction at university level, right. given the skills they acquire in the basic education sector. We have had a huge uh, dilemma with poor literacy levels coming out of school because English is a second language and we don't have very uh, good teaching in the uh, indigenous languages of the people of South Africa. So it's still an area of innovation uh, we need to develop in. We're hoping uh, that we will use more and more of indigenous languages and have second languages English uh, but as truly a second language rather than a transition from basic competence in your indigenous language at early grades and then full English from grade three onwards. It's been a problem for learning, uh, and so we have had to uh, provide uh, support for foundation programs in English or bridging programs in engineering, etc. because where there are technical uh, uh, degrees, students do find quite a struggle. And several of those programs have actually been very, very successful. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so I have also have a question about uh, reconciliation. Um, to what extent your countries are trying to institutionalize education for reconciliation? Uh, Minister Panda, why don't we start well, with you? My own sense is that uh, much more needs to be done. We've had some uh, instances that have surprised me because uh, I believe that in higher education, you're at the highest level of intellectual activity. And so to find someone uh, promoting gender inequity or being racist is really a testimony to the fact that your intellectual project is not succeeding. Because hmm. you should be acquiring uh, human rights and uh, uh, approaches to the dignity of others that are positive, rather than the examples of some very bad instances. Uh, that we've had in our country, but we come from a history of prejudice and discrimination. And so it's, uh, I think, something we have to work at. My own uh, assessment is, I think, given where we've been, uh, due to most wonderful leaders who had foresight, uh, such as our late President Mandela, we have built the basis for a nation um, that has come together and tried to work at a very difficult project of reconciliation, and I think have begun to make a success out of it. But one cannot deny uh, that we do have to pay attention to uh, ensuring that everybody actually acquires um, the principles and values that are enshrined in our Constitution, and which we hope everybody would exhibit uh, in their daily lives. That's still a project, it's ongoing, but it's a wonderful project to be a part of. Uh, Minister. We signed peace very recently, and peace is really, you know, not an accord that you sign. It's a construction uh, that is done day by day, in which you have people, adults, young people that are able to relate with each other, to, that are empath, you know, they have empathy, they tolerate, they don't go to extremes. And that is exactly what we in Colombia are trying to build, or we're trying to build. I mean, President Santos would always say that, you know, signing of the peace was only the first step, but the big, big, big aspect of the peace would come afterwards and would come with the way that we would relate uh, between Colombians, relate with each, with each other. And education plays the biggest role there. Uh, we launched a program uh, several years ago to 
I mean, all schools in Colombia, that was called, um, um, let me try to translate, it was called a Pacific Generation. I mean, it's, 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 and basically, it's not the best translation, but basically what we wanted to promote was young people in schools uh, being aware of what they had to start, you know, constructing within themselves and with the rest of their, uh, of, with the rest of the students uh, for Colombia to be different in the future, to not repeat the, the history that we had, you know, lived for more than 50 years in the country. So I think that, you know, in that, we need many, many more years of work, and we need to change culture. I mean, we need to change the way we relate uh, be among, among, among Colombians. So I think that's the biggest challenge today, and the only way that we will be able to have a prosperous nation in the future. Um, let's talk about some controversies. I mentioned that ministers are blamed for everything. Um, uh, Minister Pandor, um, there was a very high-profile campaign on campuses in South Africa called the uh, Fees Must Fall campaign, uh, demanding lower tuition fees. Um, it's been a few years since that erupted. Uh, how do you reflect on that whole episode? Well, I think uh, for several years, um, the fee level increases in South African universities had been well beyond inflation levels. And for many, many parents, including middle class, uh, they had become increasingly unaffordable. And I think the strike was related to that. Government subsidies were inadequate in terms of covering some of the costs uh, of university education, because the Fees Must Fall campaign was, main, was mainly in the university sector. Uh, the government uh, responded following a commission that investigated whether there are models we could adopt. And uh, the decision was to try and broaden uh, support for young people from the poorest and working class families. So we have a program uh, through which uh, families that have a joint income at a certain threshold have access to free education, which includes tuition costs, uh, payment for accommodation for students who would need that, so there's a means test uh, uh, that is carried out, including looking at the tax uh, 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 you know, submissions of the uh, applicants, uh, parents. And um, that scheme has, I think, helped us to quell uh, some of the uh, protests. But there's a continuing demand. Young people are insisting that there should be free higher education. And I have uh, said to them, I don't think it's affordable for the country, but I do think South Africa has a responsibility to support the poorest who are talented and who are doing well uh, uh, at university. So we have academic uh, criteria that you must meet. You have to pass a certain proportion of your courses in order to continue uh, to be supported. And thus far, uh, you know, fingers crossed, uh, it's gone, gone well. But you think that new um, financial arrangement is a better one? Um, you, you think the, the campaign uh, at least achieved that? I think it's a vast that? improvement. We have had financial support for many years, uh, but it included a loan component. And now it's a full bursary if you come from a poor background. Uh, where I think we haven't yet found the answer is for the middle class, the lower middle class. So it would be your teachers, your nurses, the children of that category of our communities. Uh, we still need to find a permanent model for them. We've had an interim uh, 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 provision, but it's not fully integrated into the budget uh, at the moment. But for the most poor, I think we've got a good model. Uh, Minister Gia, I noticed that uh, Colombian teachers have been on strike a, a number of times, uh, even just this year. Um, what's that all about? Um, we had a big strike last year. Uh, and I have to talk about that one to talk about the one this year. Um, the big strike was I mean, related to several increases in, in, the sal in salaries, and it was you know, a 37-day strike, 8 million students without classes for those days. I mean, it was a tough moment of my life, and I think of, of many. I mean, it was, we had to negotiate, and, and at, the, at the end, we were able to, you know, to, to sign uh, an agreement with more than 20 points. This year, they went uh, several times, but only, you know, every time they went uh, to strike, it was a one day um, stopping. And it was demanding 
uh, it was for them. I mean, the reason, the, the, the reason that they would tell everyone was that they were demanding the, um, that we would uh, fulfill all the points of the agreement that we signed last year. Uh, my answer all the time was, we are you know, meeting you know, every month. We are going over each of the points. We are you know, doing what we, what, what, what we can do and we need to do. And there's no point in going to, to a strike. But you know, anyway, this, this, has, this, this happened. I came out of office uh, several months ago. And uh, there was another strike after I left office. So I mean, this is an uh, ongoing issue in the country. Um, I, I noticed that you used to be, uh, I think, Deputy Minister of Defense. Yes. So you know, I'm tempted to ask, who's tougher to deal with, uh, the teachers or the army? <laughs> well, I mean, in both sectors, I, I mean, I, I really admire the military people in Colombia. And I worked at the Ministry of Defense when we were, when we were in the middle of the war. So, you know, we kept, you know, going around Colombia and, you know, meeting heroes. I mean, people that were there really defending uh, our security, uh, risking their lives. And sometimes I go today around Colombia and see teachers, you know, doing the incredible in the middle of nowhere. So, you know, there's even a way to compare them. I and mean, sometimes I tell them you're heroes because you're doing, you know, you're saving lives and opening opportunities for kids all around the country. So I have to say that in both places I could say that, you know, I, I had incredible moments and very difficult ones. Today, I can say that my, my most difficult moment was when I was in the Ministry of Education with this strike with the labor union. I mean, not with the teachers, but with the labor union, which is a tough labor union in the country. Uh, I, I'm sure many people will sympathize. Um, I'm afraid that's all uh, the time we have. Um, but a round of applause, please, for, for our guests. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you.